Uh, today I want to talk about interchangeability and switching. And I, for full disclosure, I do work for AbV, and therefore I'm compensated by AbV. Uh, AbV is actually supportive of the entry of biosimilars into the marketplace, but what we look for is robust, uh, comprehensive data to support their entry. So today we'll touch upon some of the initial perspectives that we have on interchangeability. We'll look at some clinical considerations. Why do they matter? Uh, how structure of molecule can influence immunogenicity, uh, and what all this means then in terms of considering biosimilars as interchangeables. The, the first thing I want to point out, which is very hard to see on here, is um, that there is an importance and an urgency to really address interchangeability. Because in the absence of interchangeability, you will get things like this happening, which um, is from CVS Healthcare. So CVS Healthcare, one of the largest pharmacy benefit managers in the US. So basically what they've said here is um, that they understand that there is an inter interchangeability designation out there. Um, that's in here, it's hard to read. But they understand there is interchangeability uh, designations out there. They understand, therefore, that they cannot auto-substitute biosimilars for an originator in the absence of interchangeability. But in this line here, it says, but they consider biosimilars to be therapeutically equivalent. And if they're therapeutically equivalent, then why do we need an interchangeability standard? So here's some questions we have to ask CVS. And then uh, this section here refers to grandfathering patients. So this now refers to the patient that is happily responding on an originator. And should they be switched to a biosimilar? And what are the risks of that? And do we understand those risks, risks fully? And do we have the data to support that? So because CVS consider biosimilars at the biosimilar level to be uh, therapeutically equivalent, they see no issue with grandfathering. So what have they done? They then decided that for next year, they're going to remove originators from their formulary. So for Zarxio in here, Zarxio will be the biosimilar on the CVS formulary, and the originator Neupogen will not be available any longer. So they've made a carte blanche decision to switch all patients, whether they've been exposed to the originator or not. So the question is, do we have the right data to support such a switch today? And for interchangeability, how do we really collect the right data that would support this transition of patients on an originator to a biosimilar, to an interchangeable biosimilar. So the interchangeability uh, designation has different components. They're quite interesting. Uh, the product has to be biosimilar first. Um, it has to be expected, very interesting word, expected to produce the same clinical result as the reference product in any given patient. And this, again, is an interesting term. And then there is the issue of alternating and switching. And what we look upon that as is immunogenicity, as has already been mentioned. So when one looks at interchangeability, um, we would love to see what the FDA thinks um, should constitute uh, the basis for interchangeability. Th some thoughts might be, what role is there for analytics above and beyond that use for biosimilars? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what are the design of approach, uh, appropriate clinical switching trials to address this alternating and switching? Is there a role for real world evidence? And what is that role? And being here with uh, the folks from Corona that have uh, one of the largest registries in the US in the disciplines that we're interested in, what role for Corona in setting up a registry to evaluate both biosimilarity and interchangeability. And then some definitions related to some of the interesting terms that are in the, uh, the language uh, that are in the BPCI Act. So can we learn anything from the FDA's assessment of biosimilars related to analytics? Uh, two interesting figures here. This one uh, is quite interesting because of the arrows. So we know that the platform for biosimilarity assessment is the analytical characterization. And, and the arrows here mean that uh, there is an ability to evaluate biosimilars on their degree of structural and functional similarity, such that there can be a decrease uh, 
um, in the clinical trials required. And this all goes to this notion of residual uncertainty, as has been mentioned. But the arrow uh, implies that there is a quantitative mechanism to assess structural and functional characterization such that one can quantitatively then assess what clinical requirements um, must be performed by the biosimilar. And if you dig deeper, the FDA have come up with a mechanism to look at quantitative assessment of analytics. So they've coined different tiers of attributes. Uh, and some of these tiers are very, really quite important, such that there is a statistical equivalence test placed upon their comparison. And other attrib attributes uh, are less important, so the statistical similarity assessment is less robust. So the question here is, for biosimilars, uh, the tier one attributes have mainly focused on the functional attributes of a molecule. As Vivica mentioned, they are binding to TNF, binding to membrane TNF, inhibition of TNF-induced cell lysis. Now, in, for interchangeability, the question is, are there different attributes that might come into play? Those that might have more influence on immunogenicity, those that might be more structural in nature, and is that what we're really con concerned about when we talk about interchangeability and the an analytics associated with interchangeability? Is there a mechanism to separate biosimilars based upon their uh, analytical similarity? Yes, the FDA have put out a guidance, the clinical pharmacology guidance, and it separates out analytical similarity into different categories. So again, this implies there is an ability to put biosimilars or candidate interchangeables into different classes. And maybe to, to support interchangeability, uh, you might think that there is a higher level of an analytical similarity that is required that is based both upon the functional attributes of the molecule as well as the structural attributes that we know is important for recognition by the immune system of a patient. And then in terms of Beyond the analytics, uh, the clinical studies that are required to evaluate switching. Uh, this was a great paper published by Jonathan Kay and Tom Dorner in Nature Reviews of Rheumatology, where he actually went through all the different trial designs um, that one could use to study biosimilarity. And th this one is a, a transition trial. It's a one-way switch. Uh, there's a switching trial where you switch from the biosimilar over to the originator as well. And then there's the multiple switching trial. And you can see what Jonathan has said here in his paper. Demonstration of interchangeability should require testing of repeated switches between the reference product and the biosimilar. Now that's because when you put into a patient a molecule that may have novel epitopes, you need to put that molecule into a, pa a patient a couple of times to ensure that the immune memory is sufficiently activated to recognize the product. So in his trial design here, he recognizes that one must remove the antigen and then put the antigen back into the body to assess whether there's going to be any immunological consequences to the patient. So then there are some studies, there's a study just published uh, a couple of weeks ago called Norswitch. So this is a transition study. Uh, the study transitions from the originator over to the biosimilar. It does not do the reverse. There are no switches here. Um, the endpoint of this study is a composite endpoint across six different indications. Um, and there are certain statistics applied to assess whether the primary endpoint was met. Uh, the effect size here of 30% was primarily based upon uh, data from the rheumatoid arthritis uh, population. So the results are, uh, as have been briefly mentioned before, uh, in the red box, the trial did meet its primary endpoint, which said that, was, uh, it, that switching to uh, the biosimilar was not inferior to keeping on the originator. However, when you really look at the data, there are some interesting questions raised related to the performance of the biosimilar in different populations. And it would have been great to have statistical uh, assessment of each of the individual disease states as well. And maybe we'll get that in the future. When you look at the serious adver the adverse event profile, um, there was no real differences between the biosimilars uh, versus the originator. 
And then the authors concluded the Norswich trial demonstrated that switch from um, infliximab to the biosimilar was not inferior relative to continued treatment with infliximab. Okay. But then they also stated that the results support switching from infliximab to the biosimilar for non-medical reason, reasons. And the question I raise is, does the data really support that, given the way that they've designed the trial? So what role for real-world evidence in determining uh, how patients do respond to a switch from an originator to a biosimilar? So this is a registry that's emerging from Europe. It's from Denmark. It's called the Dan Bio Registry. So what they've done here is taken a large cohort of patients. They've got 800. Um, they pre first presented their data uh, in EULAR earlier this year. That was a three-month time point. They've now extended that, and they will present the data again at ACR for the full year time point. Um, but basically, they've got a cohort of patients that have been on Remicade for a median time of about six years. So these are patients that are responding to Remicade. They have done so for quite a while. They're switched over to the biosimilar. And then about a year later, the question is asked, how are they responding? So as the authors conclude, for the most of the population, they did fine, largely unaffected. But then they also note that for a proportion a subpopulation of patients, 15%, for some reason they had stopped their treatment with the biosimilar, um, either for an AE in a proportion or for loss of efficacy in 7% of these. So then the authors conclude, however, several patients stopped treatment, this warrants further investigation before such a non-medical switch can be recommended. So the question is, does the data really help us understand the switching of patients from an originator to a biosimilar, and what data do we need to collect to better understand how we do that? So if we move to some of the clinical considerations, what we focus on here is, is a patient that is responding to an originator product. Patients take a long time to find a product uh, that is right for them. And you have a lot of patients on any originator molecule um, that they've been on the therapy for quite a number of years. And as you can see, this is from adalimumab's rheumatology uh, data. 10 years, there's a sustained clinical efficacy over time. So the relationship between the patient and the therapy is um, a complex one. They're seeing the therapy come into the body uh, constantly every time they get a dose. There is an immune equilibrium that's set up. There is an immune tolerance to the antigens that are delivered in each batch of therapy that they continuously get. And ultimately, with that immune tolerance becomes a sustained clinical response. So what we're asking here is if we introduce a biosimilar with potentially novel epitopes or antigens into this space, how will that disrupt this immune equilibrium? or will it disrupt that immune equilibrium? We know that uh, if one studies immunogenicity by different, uh, so what you've got here is different disease states and their immunogenicity levels. And it's just to point out that we know different diseases have differences in immunogenicity, even if you assess them by the same uh, assay. And that's to support the point that immunogenicity is quite variable and dynamic, not just across disease states, but also within individual patients. And uh, the relationship of a patient to uh, the therapy from an immune tolerance perspective is also really quite interesting. Up here, you have normally when the immune system reacts to an antigen, you have a transient appearance of the antigen. And then the immune system kicks in, uh, mounts an immune response to the infectious agent. It's usually a virus or a bacteria. And then ultimately, once the immune system has cleared that infectious agent, the immune system turns itself off. And so you see the antibodies disappear. So this is normally what would happen as you see an infectious agent. Uh, what's shown here is more akin to what you might see uh, for a patient with a chronic inflammatory disease on a therapy. So what you see is persistent antigen every time they get a dose. And then you see initially patients may mount a primary immune response to the therapy but hopefully through time they'll get over that and you won't see any immune response after that. 
but these are all nice smooth curves and they're not really reflective of what happens uh, on a day-to-day -day basis for the patient. And this was an attempt over here to show you the dynamic uh, immune response, response of a sample patient as it responds to uh, a therapy coming into it over time. And it's much more dynamic. It's a dynamic situation because uh, the patient is also exposed to various environmental antigens, and these all conspire to dictate how you will respond to a therapy at any one uh, moment of time. So what we know is when immune tolerance is induced, you have a protein, carbohydrate, the antigens, the immune system will see that, will tolerize against that set of antigens. Uh, and then the question becomes, if you change the antigens, does that now upset the immune tolerance, the immune equilibrium that's been set down? Is there any evidence that out there that uh, this is actually a real phenomenon? It's, uh, there's limited evidence and it's emerging. So here's an example of uh, a paper uh, that actually showed differences in confirmation between a biosimilar and an originator. So what they did here was they made a series of polyclonal antibodies to different parts, to different peptides along the molecule. And then they took those polyclonal antibodies and they asked the question, do these antibodies react the same to the originator as they do to the biosimilar? So the results here are in the blue and the red. Um, so what you see here is the, po the same polyclonal sera, sera reacting to the originator in blue and then reacting to the biosimilar in red. So obviously there are differences and the authors here conclude that MAB unfolding can raise the risk of immunogenicity by presenting new epitopes that usually are buried inside a MAB molecule, uh, releasing them onto the surface so that they can be tech detected by the immune system. And there is the concern, therefore, that that may make, break the tolerance of a patient's immune system. You may get a reaction to the, the therapy and you lose response. So where might these differences come from between a biosimilar and originator? And what are the differences that we might be looking for? So on any one molecule, uh, there are different structures. Uh, for biosimilarity, there's a lot of concern about deamidation and oxidation. And if that happens where the business end of the antibody is, uh, that might result in an imp impediment to the binding of the TNF ligand. And that would uh, result in differences in efficacy or mechanism of action. So for biosimilarity, one is looking for those types of differences in structure. For immunogenicity, switching, and differences in conformation, one might focus more on uh, glycosylation changes. These are these big molecules on the um, stem part of the antibody, and these can have the effect of twisting the molecule in such a way that the conformation's changed such that new epitopes are revealed. And if new epitopes are revealed, the immune system is activated, patients then may lose response, they may break tolerance. So where these differences might come from? Well, when a biosimilar is made, uh, it takes the DNA sequence of the molecule that is uh, available publicly, it puts them into a vector, it transfects them into cells. Where the DNA sequence integrates into that genome is random. So it could, if, uh, if, for example, uh, the DNA sequence um, integrates into a quiescent part of the genome, that will result in a different structure versus if it integrates into a hyperactive part of the genome. So that's very important um, in terms of the resultant structure of the ultimate cell line you're producing. We also know once you have a cell line, when you grow it in the culture or when you purify it through the different mechanisms that one uses to purify these things, that all of those uh, factors impact the structure of the antibody uh, and the resultant epitopes and confirmation that it may confer on the patient. So in terms of uh, product quality attributes, it's worth noting that um, interchangeability is an additional standard beyond biosimilars. So a biosimilar may be approved despite certain structural changes. Um, and in, indeed, in some cases, uh, the FDA have requested um, clinical data to assess uh, patients from a single crossover
And, and what they're looking for there is whether there's a major risk in terms of hypersensitivity, immunogenicity, or other reactions. What they're not looking for there is the data to support switching back and forth as would be exampled in the interchangeability designation. So what we're interested in is how can we measure uh, structural attributes that impact confirmation that might impact immunogenicity. Um, we've talked about glycosylation. It's very sensitive to how the molecule's built uh, and it does impact mechanism or pharmacokinetics, but also importantly for this discussion, immunogenicity. So as an example here for adalimumab's manufacturing history over time, what you have are different gly glycans on the molecule. So this is the largest glycan on Humira. This is a, what we call a G0F. This is an agalactosyl fucosylated glycan. Um, we have a, a galactosyl uh, gl glycan and then we have mannose glycans. And you can see through time that there's been a proactive conscious approach to keeping these very similar, such that patients receive essentially uh, very similar batches of product over time, which supports their immune equilibrium status and supports their sustained response uh, to the product. We can measure confirmation. Uh, there's a technique um, called hydrogen deuterium exchange. And what you see here are different batches of adalimumab from different times horizontally. So this is a technique that basically the antibody is soaked in a radioactive solution of deuterium. So what happens is that the radioactive solution gets into the antibody where it can, and therefore that sh shows as a hotspot. So you would see that here as red and yellow. So that means it's accessible to the radioactivity. Uh, where the antibody twists and inside it, that would show up as blue. So now we can actually have uh, an assay that shows confirmation. And we can assess if different batches, for example, have an impact on the confirmation of the molecule because we would be concerned that if there's a confirmational difference about the patient's ability to see that as a different epitope and therefore stimulate an immune response to it. Uh, we can actually quantify this data and put it into graphical form, but it doesn't look as pretty as this figure. But what we see out there is in the literature, people have certainly noted that changing glycans, in this case, there's a change in a galactose glycans, and you can see that changing galactose impacts the conformation of the molecule, uh, as well as its receptor binding. And so in this particular paper, what you have is uh, the normal galactose here, and then the increased galactose uh, induces a measurable change in conformation. So for, you know, the, the authors also note that um, these changes went undetectable. They're hard to find these changes. And so for things like interchangeability, uh, should these be things that we factor into uh, the assessment of uh, the biosimilar to be interchangeable? Um, it's not restricted to galactose. Um, that you, one can find data on mannose, uh, which impacts um, clearance, clinical, um, the clinical performance of the molecule. And then there's also sialic acid, which uh, can change conformation because it uh, changes the way, the conformation of the antibody would change the way the antibody molecule binds to certain receptors on the cell surface. And what cell surface receptors are we talking about? Well, the receptors over here are primarily um, related to how the antibody performs mechanistically. So binding to soluble or membrane-bound TNS. So that's not really what we're interested in when we talk about uh, switching interchangeability and immunogenicity. We're really talking about this mode here, which is relative to C-type lectin receptors. So antibodies that are seen by the immune system, that are seen by dendritic cells, they are picked up. The antibody, first of all, has to bind to the receptor, and how it engages that receptor is dependent upon its conformation. So if that conformation is different because you've changed the structure on the molecule, then the way that the molecule is taken up by that dendritic cell, and therefore the activity status of that dendritic cell has been changed. Uh, and so uh, these receptors are important for immune presentation of the antigens to the immune system. So what happens? Um, when a patient receives another dose of a, of a biologic therapy, 
the dendritic cell will chop that molecule up. Uh, the user it uses a receptor called DC sign, which inside the cell allows presentation of that biologic therapy back to the patient's immune system. The patient's immune system is asking, is this new or is this different? If it's if it's the same as that they've seen before, then the immune tolerance is not broken. If they see something different, the immune system may be uh, stimulated to react to that new epitope and mount a, an immune response. And that's maybe where you might see uh, a loss of response. There are other receptors related to dendritic cells, galactin-type receptors. These control the overall activity of the dendritic cell, the overall state of inflammation of the, pa of the patient's immune system. And if they are changed because of a conformational difference on the cell surface, that dendritic cell could be activated or suppressed in different ways. And if that's important to um, how the therapy actually has an impact on um, mechanistically on, on certain aspects of the disease state, mucosal healing in IBD, for example, that could be impacted. But it's also important in terms of um, how the cells are activated related to an immune response. If you've got an activated dendritic cell um, when it ordinarily shouldn't be, you may have what's called a bystander immune effect and then you've stimulated that immunogenicity to the agent when ordinarily you wouldn't do that. So structures um, on the molecule can impact conformation and that could have impact on immune recognition uh, and immunogenicity. This is my last slide. So hopefully, um, what, I've, what I attempted to do was just raise some questions and considerations um, related to how we look at interchangeability uh, and switching of patients, mainly from an originator to a biosimilar. Um, try to uh, give some perspective on how we design clinical trials to evaluate better uh, some of the differences that we do anticipate in biosimilars, um, and also how we might collect those data in the future and uh, what role for you know, registries like the Dan Bio and Corona registries. So with that, I think we can go to lunch. <laughs>